Removab and its trifunctional active ingredient Catamaximab has been approved for the treatment of malignant ascites in all EC countries since 2009. This video demonstrates when and how Removab is applied and how the therapy regimen is determined. Catamaximab is approved for the treatment of malignant ascites in case there is no standard treatment available. That's the approval for this drug. So, catamoxamab is very active in the treatment of malignancies of epithelial malignancies, but nevertheless, it should be considered that all four treatments should be applied. Therefore, a patient must be in good clinical condition and there's no acute infection or bowel obstruction problem. If no contraindications exist, the patient is prepared for the therapy, which can range between 10 days and 3 weeks during an individual patient briefing. It's always good to explain to the patient all the details about the clinical management and the procedure of the treatment, and to discuss even all side effects. They are generally temporary and not cumulative, but there are some side effects in some patients. The ascites is drained before Removab can be applied in the abdominal cavity. Precise sonography and good abdominal orientation are therefore important in order to determine the future puncture site. Of course, the informed consent is very important. The patient should receive uh, thorough information about the procedure that you're planning. Um, you should have a blood count and blood clotting, and it should be inside the normal range before you start the procedure. And also, um, I strongly recommend to do an um, ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound, prior to the procedure um, to determine the perfect localization for the puncture and also to exclude that the ascites is trapped or segmented inside the abdominal cavity. There are various catheter systems available for the paracentesis and subsequent Removab application. The physician will choose one of these. Um, we have different uh, sets that we use and I think all of them work fine, but uh, there's one that we prefer most of the time. It's the Safe T Synthesis set, uh, which has different benefits to it. Uh, most important, it's a very thin system, so it doesn't give the patient too much pain. The other one is that it has a safety inlay, uh, which just adds to the overall safety of the procedure. Um, it's, this system is not too sharp, um, so you might have difficulties penetrating the fascia, so I recommend that you slit the fascia uh, with the pointed scalpel prior to the procedure. If no other factors play a role, the right-hand side of the lower abdomen is recommended as the puncture side, as there is less risk of injuring the colon this way. The procedure of paracentesis under sterile conditions begins with a local anesthetic. The two painful spots are the skin and the muscle fascia, which are numbed in two phases. After applying the local anesthetic to the muscle fascia, the same needle is advanced slightly deeper into the intraperitoneal cavity and abdominal fluid is aspirated in a sample puncture. This is used to estimate the thickness of the abdominal wall. The next step is the actual puncture and insertion of the drainage system. During the puncture, I would strongly recommend to do at least one um, ultrasound to determine the best puncture site for your procedure and to exclude any adhesions of the bowels to the abdominal wall. Um, if the puncture site is very difficult, I would um, recommend to do the procedure as an ultrasound guided puncture. A scalpel is then used to cut open the pierced fascia a bit more to make it easier to insert the catheter later on. Using light pressure, it is then inserted perpendicularly. The indicator will switch to red in the event of tissue resistance. Red means caution. The obturator is pushed back. The sharp cannula is exposed. Watching the monitor is important while the catheter pierces the peritoneum. The patient can help by tensing his or her abdominal muscles. A little ascites is again aspirated intraperitoneally. The indicator has switched to white again, which means safe, because the cannula tip is in the open abdominal cavity and is protected from the obturator. 
The cannula can now be removed. A bit of abdominal fluid is aspirated as a final test. It drains easily and is not tainted with blood. The catheter is also well placed. Hemorrhagic ascites may indicate that a larger vessel has been injured. However, in patients with malignant ascites, hemorrhagic ascites is a common feature as peritoneal invasion of the tumor can also cause damage of blood vessels. The catheter is now fixated with a suture and covered with sterile dressing. Good fixation is important because the catheter will remain inside the peritoneal cavity for the entire treatment period and should not be inadvertently pulled. Then the collection bag is attached. The patient can now be transferred to a quiet patient room for the drainage of the ascites fluid. Um, during the drainage of ascites, I would recommend to do it in uh, different sessions if the patient has high volume ascites. Uh, if you want to drain more than four liters in one session, I would recommend um, to replace some of the volume with IV fluids. The Removab application begins with an infusion of 500 milliliters isotonic saline solution into the abdominal cavity. Then, using a three-way stopcock, 250 milliliters isotonic saline solution and 50 milliliters diluted Removab solution are simultaneously applied over three hours through a precision syringe pump. In general, you have to apply four injections within 10 days. So day zero, day three, seven and 10. But in case of problems, in case the patient is not fit enough for any injection, you can delay the treatment regimen until a time period of 20 days. So my recommendation is to try your best to keep the 10 day schedule but in any case of clinical unbalance, you have to delay it for one, two or three days. If the patient's condition permits it, he or she will usually spend the time between Removab administrations at home. Therefore, it is important to be well informed about possible side effects. In general, it's well tolerated and I think it's important to underline that regarding quality of life in general, the non-hematological side effects are important for the patients. And if you talk about chemotherapy, for instance, poor neuropathy can impact daily activities. In case of catamaxumab, there are some side effects such as hypovolemia, such as fever reaction or abdominal pain. But in general, they are all only temporary for some hours and you can manage them by simple drugs such as paracetamol or other painkillers and in general they are non-cumulative. There are some patients, um, for instance patients with mucinous cancers, they have sometimes multiple spaces of ascites. In this case, I recommend to try to determine which of them are really relevant for the impact on quality of life. So, in general, there are two or three. And then to puncture them and to distribute the dose of catamaxumab of two or three different spaces um, with malignant ascites. In case of perfusion and malignant site, it's important to discriminate patients with symptomatic perfusion and patients without any symptoms. In case of symptomatic perfusion, I recommend to make first the pleural function and maybe a subsequent pleurodesis and then to focus on the malignant situs with the treatment of catamaxumab. <laughs> 